Uh, excellent. So my name is Jason Bush. I'm the Executive Director of the Oregon Wave Energy Trust. And I recognize several people in the room. Uh, I was a little unsure uh, about what we were going to do today. I thought maybe it was more student-oriented. Uh, but it looks like we have maybe a few students here and uh, some, some, uh, some professors and others. Um, so Sean asked me to talk a little bit about the Oregon Wave Energy Trust and what do we do. Um, I do have a, um, a brief version of that and it's just adequate. We'll just take the rest of the day off. But uh, in short, the Oregon Wave Energy Trust seeks to put things like that out in places like this in order to create some of that. And so we can have more of these. And so we have more of that and less of that. And that's pretty much what we do. We've been doing that for the last six years. So that, in, in a nutshell, we're, we're trying to make ocean energy a reality in Oregon. And um, we've been at it for about six years. And I'll tell you a little bit more about it in just a moment. In this room, I suppose this, this slide may or may not be appropriate. Um, you, you all know why we're having the conversation when people ask why wave energy. Uh, I like to start with the answer, well, because it's a form of energy, and the question really should be, how are we thinking about, the, what, are we, what are we doing for the future in order to address our energy needs? There are a variety of reasons why ocean energy and other forms of energy uh, generation are appropriate topics and things that we ought to be investing in and uh, uh, in improving our, our skills and our technologies in order to uh, provide new forms of, of energy for uh, not just the United States and Oregon, but, but for the rest of the world. Quickly, of course, climate change, there, there is a consensus that this, despite the popular press, we're not really debating the science of climate change anymore. Uh, environmental degradation is, 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 is well known, associated with fossil fuel industry. Uh, security of energy supplies, uh, we understand why we have a Department of Defense budget the size that it is because we're policing the world in order to make sure that our, uh, our, our fuel lines are open and available. Um, if we internalize the cost of the Department of Defense uh, in order to secure our fuel lines, uh, you probably couldn't afford a gall gallon of gas. Eight, nine, ten dollars a gallon has, has been estimated. Uh, there is, of course, a growing need for, for, for energy. Uh, we're expected to, to double our energy needs by 2050 by the International Energy uh, Association estimate. Uh, that's, that's pretty impressive, and that's at a time when uh, our own energy infrastructure is aging, and the average age of U.S. infrastructure is about 50 years old. The uh, American Association of, of, um, of Civil Engineers, I think that's right, uh, ASCC, uh, gave, gave our energy infrastructure a D plus in their last uh, review of our energy infrastructure. Uh, it's not good. Uh, I just was reading just the other day, the, even from the coal industry's perspective, they think that there will be about 34 gigawatts of generation coming offline from coal facilities in the next five years. Think about that, 34 gigawatts. What do we replace that with? Uh, clearly, conservation efficiency is, is, is key, uh, but even with that factored in, the, uh, the IEA uh, estimate was based on top of the assumptions around improved efficiency of, of energy. And I heard a great phrase the other day, I want to say it, because I want other people to start saying, we need to start using energy better and using better energy. I think that captures in a nutshell what we're trying to do here. Um, wave energy. Uh, well, we know the, 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 the fundamental reasons at the, at the high level why we're talking about wave energy. Uh, the, the, in particular, the continued use of energy and the increasing need from especially the BRIC countries, uh, Brazil, um, uh, Russia, India, and China. If those developing economies grow anything like we expect them to, do, to uh, our need for energy is just really off the charts. And uh, we've really got to come up with new ways to provide. Uh, I think that uh, distributed generation through th things like wave, wave energy, uh, solar, wind, um, geothermal, biomass, all of the above, uh, will be key to that. If we're relying on some large centralized facilities burning coal, um, it doesn't bode well for our future. So, the energy in the ocean is sitting out there. It's a relatively untapped source. Um, it's, it's tremendous. The, the concentrated energy sitting there from, from, from solar energy and, of course, the, the, the winds that are largely derived from, from solar power, uh, resulting in, in wave uh, motion on the west coast, places like Oregon, uh, Alaska, Europe, uh, Portugal, Spain, uh, the UK. The UK, by the way, is clearly the leader in ocean energy throughout the world. They've invested billions of dollars in ocean energy to date. Um, we're a, sort of, we want to be a fast follower here in the United States. Thank you for that invitation. I think I'll pass. <laughs> huh. uh, um, 
We're trying to be a fast follower in the United States, and in Oregon in particular. We're not going to we're not going to try to duplicate the kind of investments that, that <coughs> Scotland has made, for example, in, in ocean energy. But we can build on what they've done. We can take advantage of the of the lessons that that, that they sometimes learned uh, with, with scars and, and extreme cost. Uh, so that ocean power is sitting out there waiting to be tapped. And given that about half the world's population lives within about 100 kilometers of, of ocean shores around the world, you see that it provides just a tremendous potential for, for, uh, for deriving energy from the ocean. And finally, a, a, a sort of a key point about wave energy, as, as compared to other forms of renewable generation, wave energy uh, appears to be highly predictable and reliable. And that means a lot on a very basic monetary level. One of the problems, how many folks in the room speak energy? And we're talking about base load generation, shaping and firming, all that kind of stuff. And we get this. Um, coal plants, base load generation, hydro can function as base load. It runs all the time, right? This, you, turn, you turn your coal plant on, it runs at 100% or 99, 98% uh, constantly. Uh, and then as the, so the demand during the day goes up and down, you add other forms of generation on top of that. And, and, and combined cycle natural gas is sort of the, the form of uh, energy of choice for meeting those varying needs during the day. It's sometimes called a peaker plant. You, within an hour, you turn it on and you get ready for the inevitable peak in the afternoon. You know people are going to turn on the air conditionings or, or whatever. Um, so if you add wi wi um, wind and solar on, on top of that, or other types of intermittent renewables, uh, you have this additional feature that's difficult to deal with. You have literally people sitting at consoles looking at generation and, and looking at, so in other words, supply and demand and trying to make those stay equal. They have to be within about 1% of each other. And so you're, you're dialing back or turning up forms of energy generation constantly in order to make the supply meet the demand. Otherwise, you have voltage variation and you're Peter goes, mm -hmm. and so uh, if you add wind and solar on top of that, you have this other feature because wind and solar is constantly going up and down, and there's no way to predict it. Even minutes out, you just have this rough guess of what it's going to be. Cloud comes or not. Um, wind blows or it doesn't. Um, and so it, that comes at a lot of cost. It's called shaping and firming of the power in order to make it follow the, 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 the demand curve. Um, that's an expensive thing to do. It's difficult, and it's, we're getting better at it in the, in the utility industry. Uh, by the way, this is all second, maybe third, fourth-hand knowledge. I'm a lawyer by, by, by training, not an engineer. So, um, my, my apologies to the engineers in the room. Like, oh, this guy. So, but that's the, the basic story. And um, and so we've had real difficulties with 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 shaping and firming of various types of intermittent uh, renewable sources. Wave energy promises to be a little different. Uh, wave energy, is uh, based on the work that's already been, been done, um, demonstrates that it, it is predictable. The rough numbers I've seen are 24 hours out, you know with about 95% accuracy what it's going to be at, at, at the second point in time. And as you get closer and closer, spatially and temporally, uh, the, the predictability goes up. And so much so that at 12 hours out, it pushes 98%. Um, and hour out, it could probably approach 100%. Uh, and an hour out is what we really care about because that's what the utility guys are doing, uh, planning out one hour out in order to meet the demand. Um, so that, we hope, will be one of the reasons why wave energy will have more value than some of these other forms of energy, like wind and solar. Uh, if you can bring that on, it begins to look, once, once the, the waves start, they as you know, in the wintertime, they pretty much go the whole time. They never go to zero. So in a sense, it looks a little bit like base load generation. It's not, but it looks like it's in the sense that you can always count on some basic level of, of energy. In the wintertime, it goes up very high. In the summertime, it, it, it flattens out, but it never goes to zero. Uh, by the way, um, OED is, is funding a, um, a study right now. We just received the, the uh, proposals from the RFP, request for proposals. For someone to take a much much harder look at this question of the resource characterization, and based upon what we find, we want to translate that into a document that we give to the utility industry that sort of puts it in utility language. Hey, this is what we call the enhanced value of ocean energy. It's worth more because of these features, and, and we're going to uh, be issuing that off, that uh, uh, contract here in the next couple of months, and hopefully in the next year we'll have that done. So I already sort of touched on that. 
Uh, if you look at a, a graph of, 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 of uh, energy needs in Oregon, especially on the coast, it goes up peaks in, in January because they have, everybody uses electric heat. Um, and that's also where the, the wave energy also happens to peaks. And generation mirrors load. Um, and initially, it, we've been talking about the need to put wave energy onto, um, onto substations. And substation is simply an a interconnection point on a, on a grid uh, where you can either take power on or off. And uh, generally a lot of power on or off. And um, you don't have to go to a substation, but, but it's generally preferred, especially for a full-size project. Um, that's why we've looked at, uh, in, in Oregon, up and down the coast, there are a number of substations. I'll get to that just in just a moment. But initially, because wave energy will be developed in sort of a phased development, we don't put 100 at them all at one time. We put 1 and then 5 and 10 or 15. Um, you'll be able to phase that in and begin initially to put it right on the distribution system, which significantly lowers the burdens and, and costs. Um, so a little bit backwards on, you know, so OED, what are we up to? So OED is a private nonprofit, sort of a unique entity. We're a 501c6, we're technically a trade group. Uh, but we're fairly unique in that sense because we have this, this mission that is to promote the responsible development of ocean energy. That puts me in a really good position. Uh, we don't want to see ocean energy move forward in the state. We think it's a good thing for the state, but we want to do it in a way that is respectful of uh, the ocean users and certainly of the ocean itself and the, the amazing ecological resources that we have in, in Oregon's oceans. Uh, we don't even have any developers on our board. Mostly that's because we hand out money. We provide grants. And if you're on my board, you can't get a grant because that would be a conflict of interest. So technically right now, we don't have any ocean energy developers on our board, but we do have utility companies, we have elected officials, we have fishermen, we have conservationists, we have people from supply chain that would like to build these things. Um, and we all agree that in, in the vision of what we're doing, we're, we're in, in Oregon we're trying to attract and, and build internally the ocean energy industry in Oregon. We're already the leader by far in the United States. We've done way more in Oregon uh, than any other state in the union. Uh, we want to continue that. We want to take advantage of the natural advantages that we have. And I'll talk about those in just a moment. Uh, and it keeps us up at the top. And right now, especially with the work that's been done recently with, with NIMRAC uh, and the Territorial Sea Plan, which we'll talk about in a moment, uh, we're, we're continuing to lead. And by the way, if anybody has any questions, just raise your hand. I feel like it's better to do it when you're thinking about it than waiting to the end and to have context. So why Oregon? Well, it starts with the wave resource. We've got the best wave resource in the continental United States. It's not the best in, in, in the United States. Alaska's wave resource is better. Um, but it's kind of hard to take advantage of those resources because of the lacking other features. We have a grid infrastructure, for example, that runs up and down the entire Oregon coast. It starts in the east, it runs across. It's all owned by Bonneville Power Administration. It runs across Oregon, across the Cascades and the Coast Range, and then comes down the coast. Think of it as a long extension corridor. Um, and along that uh, grid are all these substations. And many of them are underutilized because, um, because of the decline of the timber industry, basically. We used to have these big facilities taking a lot of power off, running big mills, electrically powered mills, and they're gone. And so you have a substation sitting there with the capacity to put power off or to take power on. Those substations are expensive. They take years to, to permit, and, uh, and they cost millions of dollars to build. Um, and we have, I think, 26 of them at least that are available for, for, for tapping into. So that's huge from the industry's perspective. If you're in the wind industry, when they first started building in Oregon, they often would build somewhere close to a substation because they don't spend $20 million in three years or four years permitting a new substation. Um, those are gone now. They've all been used, and only projects that can absorb the cost of actually building new ones are going to move forward in Oregon or anywhere else. Um, there's also the fact that we're close to low. We have communities all over the Oregon coast. If you go to Northern California or Alaska, there's just not those kind of features. Even Washington doesn't have the grid infrastructure or that many communities right along the coast. Uh, and uh, the, the coastal load is growing. All load requirements right now are down because of the economic decline. When companies shut down businesses, they turn off lights. They stop milling machines. So we're, not, throughout the United States, our load requirements have gone down. That's why, in part, why some of our CO2 uh, output has gone down in the last few years. We have improved in our, in, in, on that front, but a lot of it, or most of it, is because of the economic downturn. Um, 
And of course, we have world-class academic support, uh, support for Oregon State University with the Northwest National Marine Renewable Energy Center. Everybody know what NIMRC is? Yes? You may not know what NIMRC is. Okay. Good. Um, so we're really, really uh, uh, lucky to have NIMRC in Oregon. It really puts us well beyond all the other states. There's two other uh, uh, national research centers, one called SMINREC, SMINREC one called HEMREC, one's down in South Florida, one other one's in Hawaii. Uh, we obviously have the best weather of the, of the three uh, facilities. And uh, we're, we're sort of the flagship. Uh, you're the flagship. I'm not NIMRC. Um, but we do work so closely with NIMRC that I think of it as sort of the we. Uh, we're all working together to try to move ocean energy forward uh, in a responsible manner. And finally, we've got uh, the ability to build these things here. We can transport them. We can service them, deploy them. Um, so we're, we're, we're well positioned in, in Oregon. Those are the advantages that I, that I referenced earlier. And we're trying to maximize the value of those advantages in Oregon. Uh, OET focuses on uh, just a handful of areas. Uh, the external affairs piece is, is common. We work with, uh, I'm doing external affairs right now. I'm coming out and talking to people about ocean energy. I do this fairly regularly. Uh, we also work very closely with coastal communities. We also funded the fishing industry. Uh, gave them money literally to come to the table and talk about ocean energy. We were doing the planning around the territorial sea plan. We wanted them to come and be a part of the conversation. Because in Oregon, if you're going to do something uh, major like bring in a new industry, uh, you've got to have a conversation about it. People have to be at the table and have their say so. It felt like they've been heard. So we spent a lot of time and, and money to make sure that was the case. We do a lot of R&D. We fund a lot of envir environmental work. Uh, we'll look at those in the next slide. Uh, we do direct grants to companies to do research and development. Much of that work is done right here at Oregon State University at your OH Hinsdale uh, lab using the wave flume and the tsunami tanks, uh, the linear generator, uh, and then of course your, your testing centers out on the coast. Uh, um, we work on regulatory and policy matters extensively. Uh, the territorial sea plan was part of that. It's pretty much what I've been doing for the last two years constantly. I kind of poked my head up recently. We're done. And I looked around like, wow. Who's been running the organization for the last two years? Because all I've been doing is working on the territorial sea plan, uh, which is done. And uh, we can now move on and start paying attention to some of these other things. And finally, the utility markets. We work directly with the utility industry. The study I referenced earlier is the kind of uh, an example of the kind of thing that we do uh, to work directly with the utilities to bring them along with it so that when we are ready to put power on the grid, the utility industry is ready. Environmental studies, these are just some of them. Uh, and some of the folks in the room here have already have done some of this work. We've done uh, a lot of baseline work. We think that's important because baseline work, uh, if we pay for baseline work, then maybe the next developer comes along and doesn't have to. We know what the situation is. All they need to do is do the subsequent test, sort of the before and after. After they put a buoy in there, what does the EMF look like compared to what it was before they put the buoy in the water? Um, so, mythic habitats, seabirds, uh, ra bird radar study, which we learned that don't use radar to study birds. We paid over $100,000 to learn that. Uh, cumulative effects analysis is going to be a key part of this whole deal. Uh, nobody really thinks that putting a buoy in the water is going to harm anything. But when you put your 20th or your 50th or your 100th, what does that look like? You call that a cumulative effect. Um, Dungeons Crab, uh, I know we're doing uh, some green sturgeon work right now. We're also doing some more work on um, genetic markers of, of, of crab, of Dungeons Crab in Oregon to look at the, whether or not uh, there are subpopulations. Um, so the, the famous ecological effects workshop that was done here back in 2007, uh, the marine mammal studies, uh, there's a crab tagging, we kind of figure out how much these little critters move and we were really surprised at how much they move. Um, acoustic work, uh, EMF, um, and, and, and noise. Uh, that's not all of them, but that's, that's a lot of the work we've done. Uh, just real quickly, I, I wanted to uh, show you an example of sort of who's on the ground, or at least trying to be on the ground here in Oregon. You've got your NIMREC testing site existing as a project. You've got PMEC, uh, the second of the grid connected test site, which is in process. And then a number of companies that come from around the world. There are some of them are Oregon, Oregon grown. Like, Mike Morrow in the back of the room with N3. Uh, we'll talk more about Mike in a moment. Um, all the way to um, uh, Scottish companies. And most of the companies in the world are European. Uh, and they are interested in Oregon and the United States. So how do we get to this point? Um, they all started with an EPRI report in 2004 that said, hey, Oregon, you're sitting on the best place to do wave energy in the continental United States. And it set off a bit of a gold rush. I think that at one point there were 11 
FERC permits, uh, preliminary permits. FERC is the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission. Um, and they filed, there were, I think, 11 at one, one point. Um, the governor said, ah, hold on, hold on. Uh, we're going a little fast here. Let's plan for this. And we sort of started this planning process that we've been in for going on five years that is technically over now, depending on what the legislature decides to do. Uh, there probably will be some sort of anti-wave energy legislation uh, trying to change what happened at the, at the agency level, at the adopting of the Territorial Sea Plan, and we will uh, thin that off vigorously. Um, we've got uh, Oregon Wave Energy Trust showed up in 2007, uh, funded by the Oregon Innovation Council, uh, which is a group of business leaders in the state that receive a budget from the legislature on a biannual basis and they uh, uh, select industries like wave energy or clean vehicles or food processors or now the new one is, uh, is uh, aerial drones, unmanned uh, aerial drones. Um, and they invest some money into these industries to try to uh, promote them in the state hoping that there will be some sort of return on that investment in the long term. Um, when, when they selected wave energy in, in 2007, we beat out 27 or 26 other applicants. Uh, territorial sea planning process, as I mentioned, uh, ongoing, five years, over, over 100 meetings. Um, somewhere in there, NIMREC was created, um, and the Mobile Ocean Test Berth was operational, became operational in 2012. We'll see some photos of that in a moment. And in 2012, uh, there was the first actual FERC license to a wave energy company, first one in the country, uh, for the company Ocean Power Technologies that has the project off, ocean, off of uh, Reedsport. Um, at a high level here, before we look at a few technologies, um, there are several different types of ocean energy. Uh, marine hydrokinetic, based upon the motion of the ocean, uh, falls into these categories. Uh, wave energy, which we're focused on here in Oregon. Um, tidal energy, which we don't do in Oregon. Uh, we have, of course, tidal, tidal movement every day, but we don't have the geologic or geographic features that sort of funnel tides through, through narrow spaces and open up again. By putting devices in and around those, those, those narrow inlets, you're concentrating the energy every day, uh, four times or twice, uh, uh, twice in and out every day. Uh, and then ocean current. Uh, there are, of course, currents throughout the world that run always in the same direction. Um, and we hope they will continue moving in those same directions, depending on what climate change uh, has to say about that. Um, and uh, California current, not, not a particularly strong one or appropriate for, for current, at least <coughs> current technologies, but down in the southeast, that's why Florida, South Florida, and Atlantic University is working on current technologies um, where you have the, uh, the Gulf currents moving constantly in the same direction at, at a good, 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 good speed. Um, and those technologies are basically, you can think of them as wind turbines mounted to the bottom of the ocean or on kites that are tethered. And, floating in the current and have propellers on them that are turbines on them that are constantly spinning. Um, ocean thermal exchange is, uh, or OTEC in short, exists mostly in, in equatorial areas or trop tropical areas where you have a significant differential between the warm temperature at the top and cold water at the bottom. And by having that differential you can derive electricity, um, sort of like a heat pump, you're probably all familiar with. Um, and then finally offshore wind. I don't, cannot underestimate the or overemphasize really the importance of offshore wind. Um, it hasn't really started here, but it's going to be huge. Uh, offshore winds in, in, in Oregon, and California, Washington are just tremendous, some of the world's best resources. Um, further out you go, and the higher up in the area you go, the stronger and more consistently the wind blows. And um, uh, we'll, we'll see, we will definitely see some offshore wind. In fact, there's a project already underway. So, a complete diversity of technologies. There is no best technology except for Michael Morales. Um, we're we're going to be debating what is the best technology for many years uh, because it does, the question doesn't make sense right now. It depends on best for what? Near shore, deep, deep water, mid shore, utility scale, strategic, uh, distributed generation, a, a tribe in, in a tribal village in Alaska, or uh, a ginormous uh, utility scale facility off in the, in the Indian Ocean. It all depends on what you're talking about. But I just wanted to show you the concepts a little bit. I want to talk through all these. You've probably have seen most of this. Everybody generally familiar with the technologies and the companies you've seen this. Uh, but I thought the, uh, the, the little uh, animations were pretty cool. 
uh, gives you a concept here. One thing I wanted to point out, this is a point absorber like the OPT buoy. There are three motions, uh, three axes of motion in the ocean. Uh, and OPT's buoy really only takes advantage of one of them. Uh, I think secondary and third generation technologies are learning from that thing. You know, there's a second and third axis. Why not try to take advantage of that energy as well? And so the newer devices don't just go up and down. They go up and down, left and right, and to and fro. Uh, quite honestly, the, the more active they are, the, the more energy you can derive from them. Uh, the OPT buoy in particular uh, is designed to be very stationary with that one buoy, with that one float going up and down relative to the spar. Uh, some newer ones that uh, you may not have seen the animations for, the, the oscillating wave surge, some sort of underwater near shore device that has a flap that moves back and forth. And you have the uh, rotating mass, uh, some new technologies come out in the last few years, a company called Neptune and a company called Wello Oi with their penguin technology. Think of that as like a self-winding watch, around and around, as long as it's moving. It doesn't have to go around and around. As long as it's moving, it's creating electricity. And my personal favorite, the submerged pressure differential, Mike Morrow's technology. Uh, obviously, his doesn't look anything like that, but you get the idea as the way it goes with the top of it, it compresses. Um, and the pressure, you can squeeze an airbag, um, is, is the Mike's approach. So, just real quick, you've probably seen these. OPT, the concept of how big it is, this guy sitting down here with him. Uh, stable, stable spar with a uh, ballast filled um, uh, ballast at the bottom, water filled ballast at the bottom, holds that piece stable, less movement uh, further down the ocean you go, relative to the floating uh, component on the surface. There it is in the water in Scotland. This particular device runs on hydraulics. The, the one they're building here in the United States in Oregon uh, has removed hydraulics is uh, purely mechanical. They hope to uh, rem both improve the efficiency and also remove the potential for spills, for introducing uh, uh, oils into the ocean. Here's an animation. There's, you're going to have some sort of um, uh, anchoring mooring system. Uh, my, uh, these are, um, who knows what they're representing here. Um, uh, presumably not the, the concrete anchor that they currently have in the water that would probably be about this big. I think it's something like 40 tons or something. Uh, the concrete block that's filled with air, uh, at least until they pull, pull the cork and then it drops to the bottom. Uh, and then, of course, you're going to have uh, some sort of cable coming off of the floating device that's going to connect to some sort of a hub, either on the bottom or on the surface, and then bringing cables to shore, uh, a single cable to shore, which will likely be buried. Uh, very much like to be, very, be buried in Oregon anyway. Uh, very different concept here, a nearshore technology, aquamarine, sending uh, pressurized water up to shore to spin a, uh, a turbine and bring the fresh water back in the closed loop system. Here's the second generation device when it was still in the uh, building. Uh, you see the concept, the yellow part floats and it gets pushed over by the waves. There it is in the water in, in, in uh, Scotland, in the EMEC, the European Marine Energy Center. Um, uh, the facility on, on shore there is their testing area. Uh, it has the generators um, and, a, and a, a, a little uh, building that, for all their equipment. Hey, look at that. Um, I'm not sure what that was. Uh, here's an Oregon-based company, Columbia Power Technologies. Um, they're, uh, in fact, based right here in Fort Ballas, I believe. And uh, this is the, the Manta. Uh, it's, I call this a second-generation technology. It has two wings on this spinning two generators inside and moving up and down. This was deployed in Puget Sound for 18 months. I believe they're going to be going back into the, to the wave tanks here in Oregon, here in um, uh, OSU here very soon. Uh, I know that because I'm helping to pay for it. What's going on with my photos here? Um, hmm. So uh, this was, this is the uh, Northwest Energy Innovation. It was deployed in, uh, off of Yukon Head this, this summer. Uh, Sean is um, uh, seen as very, very uh, familiar with this. Helped deploy that. Uh, I guess some more photos of that. And just maybe not. What's going on here? Hmm. Well, um, I, I know what's missing there was was uh, Mike's photo uh, of the N3 technology, which is a pressure differential device. It has, lays on the bottom of the ocean as the wave passes over the front of the device. It compresses an airbag and it pushes air through a, a bi-directional turbine and fills up a second bag 
and it simply moves back and forth constantly with the, with the waves passing over the top. Uh, you can boat over the top, uh, you can't see it. These are, these are wonderful things in Oregon. The other picture that's missing, I'm sorry, is the, uh, is the um, uh, wind float, which is the principal power uh, wind turbine that is currently deployed off of Portugal. It's a two and a half uh, megawatt uh, turbine on a floating platform, which is what we'll be doing out here on the west coast. The bathymetry is steep. Um, once you get past 30, 40, 50 meters, the East Coast style or European style of, of, of uh, installing a, a wind turbine just doesn't work because, it's because of the depth uh, and cost associated with that, kind of monopile technology. So we'll have to figure out what we're going to do it out here. We get beyond 30, 40, 50 meters, well within three miles, and we're not going to be putting large wind turbines in, in the territorial sea. So. Uh, Kevin Bannister's company, Principal Power, is planning on deploying at about 15 uh, miles from, uh, uh, from, uh, from Coos Bay. So you know about NIMRAC, we can cruise through these. Um, wonderful tsunami tank uh, basin to test. Uh, this is the deployment out in uh, 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 Quinn Ahead this summer with the Northwest Energy Innovations device. they are filling its ballast and then coming up uh, uh, vertical here. This is, the, of course, the uh, Ocean Sentinel, which is Oregon State University's device uh, to which uh, the power from this device is connected. It takes that power, it, it, uh, it uh, disseminates the power into the, to the, into the water through a heat sink. Uh, it has data collection capability and the ability to send information to shore. Some more quick photos. You know about PMEC, I suppose. Everybody familiar with PMEC at this point, Pacific Marine Energy Center? Okay, this is a fantastic thing for the state of Oregon and great for the industry. Uh, is how we're going to move forward in the next few years. So a few minutes on the territorial sea plan. Uh, it all started back in 2008 uh, with the Executive Order 0807. Uh, then Pres uh, then um, uh, Governor Kulongoski said, we need to go plan for this. Um, and we need to do it in a way that is protective of our ocean users and the ocean itself. Uh, and we need to find some sites that, uh, that we'll call appropriate locations for ocean energy that minimize the impacts on the ocean and its users. And that's what we set out to do. As of about three weeks ago, we finished our, our, our territorial sea plan. It's a good plan. Um, it took a lot of effort and a lot of folks participated in that. Uh, it, it, I feel like at the end of the day, it was a well-negotiated, compromised plan for Oregon that is good uh, for the industry enough to allow the industry to toe hold, hold to move forward in the state while at the same time taking a very precautionary approach. Uh, some sort of key elements of this, uh, we did cap ocean energy at 3% of the territorial sea. The actual footprint of ocean energy will be limited to 3%. Uh, the ocean is, the territorial sea is about 1,260 square miles, so that means approximately 12.6 per, per 1%. Um, so, you know, 37, 38% uh, of the, 30, 37, 38 square miles of the ocean ultimately can be developed. Uh, we're going to review this very soon. Uh, within the next seven years or when 1% of the ocean actually gets developed. Uh, I think that was important for everyone. If it moves too quickly, we're just saying, let's, let's take a look, see how this is going. Conversely, if nothing's happening, maybe we, we took too, too restrictive of an approach. Uh, we spread the energy development out across the state and around the three deep water ports. Um, we felt that that was important so that no single deep water port felt like they were being inordinately impacted. We created several different areas for ocean energy. Um, hes hesitate to call them zones, but that's what they are. In uh, each one of these zones has different standards. Some zones uh, are completely exclusive of ocean energy, uh, and that applies really only to the marine reserves and marine protected areas. Conversely, we have areas called REFSA, uh, Renewable Energy Facility Site Suitability Areas, I think, uh, a RESA. Um, the RESA is where we want ocean energy to go, and we found four sites. We'll look at those in just a moment. We're, at those areas, we had the, the lowest of the standards, um, and then you have in between those two extremes, you have several other zones that have different levels of standards. <coughs> so you can go into a RESA, and you can also go into a RUMA, a resources use and management area. Um, beyond that, it becomes a conservation area, and you probably won't be able to meet those standards. And I think that covers I think, uh, the well into the, which would that be, about 87% of the territorial sea probably is off, off limits to ocean energy at this point. Um, so 
about, uh, as I mentioned, about 23 square miles uh, in those four areas that we picked add up to about 23 square miles, a little less than two, two square miles, uh, two, two percent of the territorial sea. Uh, the Rumas, the, uh, the management areas, and the, uh, the rest is added together is about 138 square miles. Um, and then ultimately I think that it's key to remember that the, the territorial sea plan is sort of pervaded with the precautionary principle. And we, we put that into the preamble, uh, and we think that that was important for everyone, uh, along with the, the features like adaptive management and the concept of phase development we talked about before. Uh, before you can run, you've got to walk, and that's in, in short what we're doing with the uh, phase development. Here are your four sites um, Camp Ilea, um, this is Nastucca, this is OPT's existing 50 megawatt site and then uh, right off of Reedsport and then just south of that is the <coughs> lake side. And those are uh, adding in the, the rumas as well. That's where they all are. It's, what are the three deep water ports? You mentioned that the ocean engine is spread through three deep water ports. Yeah. Uh, Coos Bay, Historia, and Newport. Newport technically is not a deep water port, but it's deep enough. What's, what are they considering deep water port? Um, uh, I don't know. I'm not sure what 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 the DL, DLCD Department of Land Conservation and Development is, is the one that sort of started calling these things the, the deep water forts. I looked it up one time. Uh, Newport doesn't technically meet the sort of the international concept of the deep water port, but in terms of getting ocean energy buoys and the kind of boats and ships, uh, the vessels that will be working with those, it is deep enough. Should be calling them the deep enough ports. Four hundred fifty feet. There you go. See, Coos Bay is somewhere around there. Okay. Right? And part of the part of the thinking is to where the hub of activities are that you're not concentrating an undue burden on one of those ports with you know, whatever curve you choose the sites to be. So it's it's a dispersion uh, of purpose. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So uh, just a little bit on the on the permitting side. Uh, this actually is taken from some work we're doing with, with PNEC, uh, sort of capturing at a high level, what kind of leases we're looking at. On the Outer Continental Shelf, uh, BOEM has, has, a, has jurisdiction, the Bureau of Ocean Energy and Management, for either a research lease or a site lease. You're going to need a hydroelectric license from FERC uh, to, to connect to the grid. Um, they have jurisdiction both in the state waters and the federal. You're going to need a nationwide permit from the Corps of Engineers and private aids in navigation. Um, so you all know, uh, does everybody speak permit in this room? I mean, you guys all can. Now, then there's the permits and then there's the compliance part. These are the sort of the uh, enforceable standards that, 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 that uh, an agency that is going to issue a permit needs to look at and consider. And so uh, NEPA, National Environmental Policy Act, being the primary of those are probably the most important for our purposes. Uh, on the Outer Continental Shelf, you've got two federal actions, two major federal actions. That's the legal language that triggers a NEPA analysis. So therefore, you have two NEPA analyses on the Outer Continental Shelf. And that, to date, is one of the reasons why nobody's bothered to do a project on the Outer Continental Shelf because of the burden, the regulatory burden associated with two NEPA analyses. Right now, there is no unified approach. Both agencies are uh, uh, intended to track separately. We're going to try and fix that. Uh, the Species Act, Marine Mammals Act, you recognize all of these, Central Fish Habitat. Um, so all the, the, the major components. State, state side, you've got, uh, if you're deploying in state waters, um, DSL, Department of State Lands, has jurisdiction for the site lease. You're going to deal with the Coastal Zone Management Act or consistency therewith. That's actually a bad and one right below it are both sort of state federal pieces that go together and stuff them under the state side. Um, removal fill permit, we've got cables coming to shore, we have to cross the, cross the beaches, uh, we've got uh, Parks and Rec with authority over that. And then water right, uh, we're going to we have legislation tracking in the current uh, session to remove water resource jurisdiction, water resources division jurisdiction over ocean energy. Uh, there's no water right entailed, uh, so why do we have uh, the, and the, uh, a company running through the water right process? Um, and then on the on the on the shore side, I think you're going to see some very difficult battles fought. Because the state, the state government, uh, the local governments, whether it's the county or the municipalities, are going to have some say so over what you can do shoreside, and they have a lot of control. Um, and if they really don't want to see ocean energy coming to shore in their in their county, it's possible 
uh, they can uh, create uh, ordinances that are so onerous uh, or restrictive that you won't be able to pass them. It also puts you into the land use process as a former land use lawyer. You don't want to be stuck in the land use process. Uh, it's expensive and it takes a long time. So, snapshot of the process. Uh, this is, we think, what PNET process might look like. Um, it's starting on the left-hand side. You've got, uh, starting right off the bat with uh, trying to get your uh, site lease with, with BOEM. Um, pretty soon after that, you're, you're pushing in your FERC preliminary permit. You're going to get the notice of intent. Uh, several different components of that to kind of keep the, the FERC permit alive. Um, the, the, I think the NEPA scoping um, bubble in and of itself is revealing um, the various components of that process. Each one of those is, is fairly onerous uh, and expensive and time. Um, moving along, you finally get to the point after, just to the point where you actually get your lease application in the door, if they're a final lease app uh, application for BOEM and or license application, excuse me, for FERC. Um, and then you move into the whole consultation process. Army Corps of Engineers sitting down there, final, uh, potentially a final EA, or in, which is an environmental uh, assessment or an in, environmental impact statement, sort of one is a baby version of the other. Uh, the EIS is a sort of full-blown environmental impact statement that you probably would have to do. Uh, finally, a lease issuance from Boeing and a license order from FERC. We hope that takes three years. Um, unless you think that looks too simple, this is just a flow chart I found from uh, Corps of Engineers for the, uh, uh, for the Harbors Act, just to get your, um, uh, your permits, your safety, uh, uh, what's it called, um, Safe Harbors Act, uh, so you don't put something out into a navigable waterway that impedes traffic. Uh, and that's a simple permit, indeed. Well, probably one of the simplest. Um, some of y'all might rec uh, recognize this. This was a chart put together uh, recently. Um, it kind of identifies uh, what we expect to be the sort of the key problems we're facing between the stressors uh, and the receptors, or stressors and receptors. The stressor being the device, the receptors being uh, living creatures or, or, pro or, or ecological processes. Um, and uh, this work was done by McMurray and George Bowler, I, I think, uh, just a few years ago. And obviously the red mean areas that we really think there's probably going to be a need to, to look at this stuff uh, very closely. Yellow, when clear and green, it seems like uh, we're going to be okay. Um, drawing to a close here, <coughs> looks like we're out of time anyway. Uh, Tethys just came out. I just got a notice of this a couple days ago. Tethys, anybody know what Tethys is? Uh, I believe she was married to Neptune, oh. the, the, the goddess of the ocean. Uh, it's also a name for a database that uh, the Department of Energy has put together with the Pacific Northwest National Labs. It just came online a few days ago. It was pretty impressive. Uh, they've gone, they've collected all the uh, studies they can, both here from, from around the world and the U.S. based, put them in one place. Uh, you can, I was looking at EMF stuff just a couple nights ago because I had nothing better to do. Uh, and you know there were about 30 articles, uh, 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 journal articles and studies done on EMF. And so we're sort of collecting everything in one place so that when uh, agencies and developers are working to move the project forward, they have a central location where all the information can be found. It's a pretty good thing for us. Uh, you would have thought that would have been put together a long time ago, uh, but they finally got around to it. Finally, uh, we have a great website, OregonWave.org. Everything the OET does is goes over to our website. Um, all the work is uh, the result of studies. It's all on there. You can download them, read them, and you can get good information about the industry, where we're going. Uh, you can become a member if you want. Um, and uh, of course, if you have any questions, feel free to call me at that, that email address. And with that, thank you very much for your time. Thank you.